Good morning. As always, it's a blessing to be here. Uh, if you do have your Bible, if you don't have one, there is one in the pew in front of you. Uh, you can go ahead and get ready and open up to Isaiah chapter 9. In our Advent series, his name is continues this morning by seeing Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Bringing us to today, we've seen how God would dwell with us by having Jesus come as Emmanuel. And with that coming, he is the light of this world showing us salvation. If you remember a few weeks ago, looking at the uh, historical context of what was going on when Isaiah issues his prophecy, things weren't good. King Ahaz of Judah had more or less turned his back on the Lord. The nation of Israel had already ready done that and they were a hot mess and in chapter 7 Isaiah introduced us to the one who was coming Emmanuel God with us and the verses following the hope of Emmanuel get grim the judgment and penalty of sinful disobedience is thematic the Assyrian invasion is promised uh, to the people and darkness looms but we cannot forget that God's light pierces the darkness. And though things look grim, Isaiah reminds where we should find ourselves when things look bleak. In chapter 8, Isaiah says in verse 17, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will wait for him. Though the immediate future for Judah and Israel was devastation, Isaiah pushes that to the past, and his focus jets forward to the promise of God that is to come. Our faith should lead us to place our hope in the Lord and dwell on his abundant grace. Our faith should lead us to place our hope in the Lord and dwell on his abundant grace. Theologian Barry Webb says this about Isaiah's prophecy. Devastation will give way to glory. As I've mentioned the last few weeks, and it's still pertinent to us, God always gives his people hope. And that is what Isaiah is drawing on as we enter the first part of Isaiah chapter 9. And so if you are willing and you are able, please stand with me as I read from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Nevertheless, the gloom of distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoiced at harvest time, and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will we be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful, thankful for just this time of year that draws our, our, uh, our minds and our hearts to your coming Son. Just be with us this morning as we look into your word. Speak into our hearts. Lord, forgive us where we fail. In your name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. As we saw last week, darkness and light 
play a major role in Scripture. And we see a culmination here after the focus on darkness up to this point. And it's because the situation initiated in chapter 7 by King Ahaz is now seeing a reversal. The people will see a release from the oppression they experience. War will eventually not be a vice for the nation. And it's subtle here, but we see no distinction between the northern and the southern kingdoms, meaning a unification will happen. And as we know, it is not just for Israel and Judah, but it is this unification for all under Christ. We need to be reminded all will bow to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And someone might think they won't. I don't believe that. But they will. Even if you go to the grave declaring disbelief, though your destination may not be heaven, when you're face to face with your maker, you will bow. Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, God does not leave his people without hope. He's already declared, Emmanuel. And through the darkness, Isaiah conveys this glimmer of hope as joy will return to God's people as he conquers. Not the people. God will conquer. And what he's doing here, before his encouragement of verse 6, which we all know, he reminds them of his love and his faithfulness. To, faith, I'm going to start that over. He reminds them of his love and faithfulness to them. In the past, he's always delivered them as he said. God delivered the people from the hands of Pharaoh, the yoke of slavery, the oppression that pushed them down. He also reminds them that when they were captive in Midian, how he raised up Gideon to defeat the Midianites. The point is, again and again, they felt oppressed. They endured suffering. They were inflicted with it. But God is a deliverer. Understand, the Lord will always deliver his people from suffering. It may not be how we want it or expect it, but he does. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't sub submit again to a yoke of slavery. That's the deliverance we need. It doesn't mean things won't be hard or tough or sad But it's found in Philippians 1.29. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. The reality is, God's people, we will suffer. It's about what we turn that suffering into. Because it's wrapped in hope. It's hope in salvation that has been given to us. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's that hope that produces the joy. That's where our rejoicing comes from when the darkness is closing in around us. It's what gives us peace. 
Because if we don't rejoice, if we don't find the joy that we have in Christ, if we don't see the hope through the clouds, then there's no peace in us. Then we allow ourselves to be oppressed by the very thing that Christ delivered us from. It's through Isaiah's message that he declares again in the midst of the darkness, the hope. What is God going to do? What's he going to do to deliver his people that he loves? And that's verse 6. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The promise of victory over sin's hold, that yoke of slavery, is found in the statements, a child will be born, a son will be given. It says to us, but that's not the focus, because it's about him, not us. Because our salvation is all about him. Our contribution to our salvation is nil. What does he tell us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? For you are saved by grace through faith, and that is not from yourself. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Because of his coming, the oppression of sin upon the people's shoulders will be alleviated. Because no longer will it fall upon sinful man to rule and to lead, but it will all fall solely on his shoulders. As king and lord, Jesus carries the burden of leading and ruling his people. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. Because he does it flawlessly. The failure of earthly kings, earthly prophets, earthly judges, earthly priests, earthly pastors and elders and deacons will be overcome by his complete and righteous reign. After establishing all of this, Isaiah now gives us the qualifications for this coming Messiah's ability to claim this rule. First, he's wonderful counselor. We have to understand, this is not talking about some earthly level of counsel. Right? So, so when we read that, don't think about like a guy sitting in a chair and you laying on a couch. And he's like, tell me your feelings. It's solely based on the wisdom of God. By the way, if you're a counselor, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. He is to be the complete opposite of all earthly leaders who have a tendency to look upon themselves and fail. You've heard me say it. I can look back on the, the years of ministry and the times things have been successful is because I relied on him. The times I failed, which probably are more, I was relying on me. This Hebrew word, wonderful, here, it appears 80 times, and nearly every single time it's used, it's talking about God. And in Hebrew, it carries this meaning of wonder on a supernatural level. It's a wonder like nothing we can fathom. So unlike Ahaz, who, who didn't even seek God's wisdom, and he led the people away from the Lord, ruined them. Unlike Solomon, who sought earthly wisdom. And even David, who acted impulsively without seeking the Lord. The coming Messiah will be one that has wisdom above all wisdom. And will share that with his people when they seek him. What does Proverbs 3 tell us, verses 5 to 8? Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. The second thing we see here is he will be mighty God. Not only emphasizing Emmanuel, which means God with us, but also his sovereign power. He will not be weak of spirit, weak of mind and heart, but he will be mighty in his ability to save. He will also be everlasting father, and this everlasting will be total. We see it generally and specifically in Scripture. Later in uh, Isaiah, it tells us in chapter 26, verse 4, Trust in the Lord forever, because in the Lord, the Lord himself is an everlasting rock. In chapter 57, verse 15, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I, will, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to rev revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. We have to remember here, Isaiah speaking on behalf of God was showing how the one to come is the opposite of all the kings that had come before. In 1 Samuel, the people demanded a king. They wanted a monarchy like the other nations, someone to rule them directly. They didn't want judges and prophets from God. And the everlasting would be the perfect fulfillment of that. And it says, everlasting father. Obviously, we don't refer to Jesus as father. He isn't the father, but that's not the implication here. Father is often used in the same context as Lord. And it's speaking here that the Messiah's care and concern for his people. How is a good father? He loves his children. Psalm 103, 13, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And then we get to Prince of Peace, which is our main focus, because it's the culmination of everything else. There's a reason it's the last thing said here. Because the peace that he brings is not some temporal soothing of my nerves. It's wonderful. It's mighty. It's everlasting. It has been the promise of what he would do. It's what is attached to that peace that we must focus on. Israel was often at war. They were attacked by enemies all around them, and it became their plight in life, mostly due to their continued disobedience to God. And so eventually, after Christ had come and declared who he was and what he would do, the people viewed him as an earthly deliverer that would lead them and conquer their earthly enemies. That's what they thought God was doing. They didn't get it. We saw that as we approach Jesus' crucifixion, as Jesus is riding into the city on a donkey, and they're praising him with palm branches, right? It's an immense scene. Because they thought, here is this earthly king who's going to help us conquer the Romans. They didn't get it. Their view of peace was temporal. It wasn't everlasting. They viewed for the here and now, not the eternity that God was laying before them. And if we aren't careful, we can even water down that promise of God's peace in the same way. We must understand the peace that God offers us is his salvation. That's why Jesus is the Prince of Peace. It's not because he is some pacifist. It's because of what that peace truly is. And he is the one who administers the peace. It's through him 
that we get it. You can't get this peace anywhere else. Isaiah brings this all together in verse 7. It's through the peace that he does what he has been called to do. He plans out the future. He defeats what we cannot. And he always keeps his promises. Doesn't that bring joy to our hearts? Has anybody in here ever broken a promise? You all should have your hands up. He does not. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. It's through the Messiah that he keeps his promise and the peace offered to humanity is found. That's why Isaiah's later prophecy in chapter 53 is so important to us. You know it, verses 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus is coming as the Messiah, as Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. The suffering that he was destined to experience was the very thing that brings us the peace that we need. It's through that, through his wounds, his death, and his resurrection, that we are truly healed. Though this time of year, we reflect on the nativity scene, this very sweet and solemn occasion, we cannot forsake why that baby came. There's a song that uh, talks about, I think it's above all, he came to die. Because that was his purpose. And he knew it. And he carried it out. Why? Because he loves us. Because he knew the only way to salvation was to go to the cross, to endure the penalty for all of humanity's sin. But it didn't just stop there, did it? He defeated that. He rose again, triumphantly, declaring the victory of God. And he tells us that when we put our trust and our faith in him, we're saved. We have this peace. We're told in 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promise of, promises of God find their yes in him. That, it is why, that is why it is through him that we utter amen to God for his glory. We need salvation. That's why he came. That's why we take time to remember his birth and what that meant for us. We need to accept the salvation that he offers to us. And all we have to do is say, yes, Jesus, I believe. And we're saved. That's the joy that we can experience. That's the joy of this season. That's the joy of knowing Christ. Because this baby that we remember became our savior at the cross to give us salvation for our sins. I want to encourage you, if you're watching online or if you're here this morning and you've never said, yes, Jesus, I believe, make that the choice you do today. Say, yes, Jesus, I believe. No one can do it for you. It's between you and the Lord. 
but it is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. I was reading this morning, actually, from a, a, a preacher I follow. And he said, pastors, give them the best Christmas present they can get this year. The gospel. We need Jesus. Because Jesus was the culmination of centuries of promise that started in Genesis chapter 3 when sin entered the world. And God knew at that point he needed to rescue his people. When we call upon him as our Lord and our Savior and our God, we find our peace in the Prince of Peace. And through that, we bring glory to God. Let me encourage you this morning, declare that joyful message this holiday season. Because through the presents and the commercialism and the Christmas movies and all that, which are okay, this is what people need. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful. Thankful for the salvation that we receive through your son, Jesus. Thankful for that promise that you made so long ago that you hold to, that you are one that always keeps your promises, God. Despite us sometimes not following through on our promises, you are always faithful. We thank you for that. We're thankful for your scriptures that remind us of these truths of this prophecy we see of the coming messiah and the reflection that we can have that when he came he came to save we praise you for that this morning lord i do pray that for anybody who, who does not know you that they say yes jesus i believe and for those of us that do believe God, I pray that we are lights for you. That we, during this season, share the gospel message with those around us, with our family, our friends, our coworkers, anyone we can, because that is truly the best Christmas present we can offer. Continue to be with us as we close our time this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.